Here's an idea. The podcast serial shows how neither the law nor journalism are perfectly objective. This episode of Idea Channel is about cereal. Before we get into the thick of it, I want to state what is maybe obvious, but I think is worth emphasizing. Serial is based on true events. An actual woman was actually murdered. It's important, I think, out of respect for Hay, her family, her friends, and anyone who has lost a family member and had to deal with legal proceedings or worse, public scrutiny that we, meaning us and you, handle commentary surrounding cereal with respect. Not kid gloves, necessarily, but respect. So that is what we are gonna try to do. Okay, so now, Serial is a podcast produced by WBEZ and This American Life, and it's hosted by journalist Sarah Koenig. In its first season, Sarah tells the history of and story of her interactions with a group of people surrounding a murder in Baltimore in the late 90s, that of Heyman Lee by Adnan Syed. The allegedly is missing because Adnan was convicted. He's currently serving life in prison. Adnan maintains his innocence via telephone from prison. He relates his version of the story and responds to Koenig's every bit of unfolding evidence, which seems in turns to acquit or condemn him. This is the central tension of Serial. Did Adnan do it? Did he kill Hay? Koenig invites this speculation in many ways, and much of Serial's considerable audience, I mean, it was the number one podcast on iTunes for several weeks, it has its own incredibly active subreddit, and even podcasts about the podcast, this audience excitedly engages in that invited speculation. And for me, this collective flailing bumps into two other tensions of which Serial is maybe a symptom, or maybe of which Serial takes knowing advantage. Specifically, the tension that arises from the expectation that both the law and journalism be, or attempt to be, objective. I'm not sure either is, and to a significant degree, I'm not sure either law or journalism can be objective. And as I'm finishing this sentence, I can sense the comment fingers warming up, so before we get too much farther, let's talk about objectivity. In one sense, objectivity is a framework for the existence of things. We might ask what exists objectively, meaning absent any one or thing who might perceive it. For example, if tomorrow we all stopped looking at or talking and thinking about mountains, are they still there? It's a pretty good bet. Most of us have no concrete reason to believe that mountains are the result of collective subjective perception. In another sense, objectivity is knowledge or action free from interference of the knowers or actors' own biases. If one is being objective, then they're not letting their own opinions or beliefs get in the way of their perception or delivering of the truth. The facts. It's a rock fact. So, how does this work for two of the five estates? Well, in jurisprudence, the philosophy of law, there is a question of whether the law is upholding a moral code which is natural. Traditionally, theories of natural law hinge on the idea that insofar as law upholds morality, that morality exists as part of nature, and through reason, we as humans uncover it. That it objectively exists, and so that is why the law has merit. Serial is an NPR show, but it doesn't go that deep. What more readily applies here to the law and journalism is the largely held belief that in the carriage of both, practitioners must be uninvolved, unbiased, pragmatic, open-minded, in a word, objective. Which is, I'll say in another word, I think, impossible. However, I don't say that it necessarily follows that either is broken, at least not on their own terms, due to that impossibility. Okay. Now, let's get back to Serial. Serial's driving force is generated when the familiar overturning the wrongful conviction of a charming character narrative meets real and actual conflicting accounts of experts and eyewitnesses, both on the show and after the fact, as to the quality, completeness, or plausibility of evidence. And it's all set within a system that we're brought up, at least in the States, to see as disinterested, especially in neat narratives, concerned to the utmost with justice. Whatever is right is right, and the system will deliver exactly that. Serial shows us how that's not necessarily the case. It doesn't show us that Adnan is definitely innocent, and it doesn't condemn the justice system in any real way, but it does illustrate a practice of law that is maybe necessarily open to a little bit more interpretation than is widely portrayed or considered. 
when it comes to criminal law, at least. Koenig says pretty much off the bat that she's not convinced of Adnan's guilt, at the very least, not of his motive. She portrays Adnan's defense attorney, Christina Gutierrez, as professional, but having worked perplexingly. Jim Trainum told Koenig that he had concerns about Jay's interrogation, but that otherwise the case the detectives built was pretty good, better than most, he said, while Deirdre Enright from the Innocence Project had no shortage of concerns regarding how Adnan's case was handled. The eyewitness testimony was mostly imperfect, let's call it, as eyewitness testimony tends to be. Stories from main players flip-flopped, highly technical evidence was maybe misunderstood, and did the whole trial perhaps have vaguely racial undertones? It's possible. Yet, almost 15 years ago, in that room, a jury took less than two hours to convict Adnan. For some of us, the constantly shifting quality of the evidence might be curious or upsetting, but ultimately is secondary to the fact that justice was done. Hay's killer was caught. For others, Serial presents a story that begins CSI but ends almost Kafka-esque. At first, we might harbor some hope that the likable subject will prevail despite the odds, but quickly it becomes clear that the system and circumstances are infinitely larger and more complicated than his situation ever was or will be. Or as Mr. Cohen says in William Gaddis's JR, there is no question of justice or right or wrong. The law seeks order, Miss Bast. Order. Which is to say the aim of the law might not be the objective determination of what is just, but rather the continued and orderly function of the law. And I wonder if that's not just another kind of objectivity, only on different terms. In my opinion, the merit of the law is not built upon that natural morality we talked about a few minutes ago. At least not entirely. For most of us, we follow the law for a combination of reasons. Because, yeah, it upholds moral principles, but also because we want to. Because we're expected to. Or because if we don't, we get punished. Law is comprised of expectations and norms as much, if not more, than it is upholding some set of objective tenets. Our law works, as far as it does, because it's why widely understood and systematized, and commented on, interpreted, revised, and shared between people, citizens, judges, lawyers, etc. Does this endanger its objectivity? In one sense, sure. Anything that invites interpretation is necessarily subjective to a degree. But in another sense, since it's so widely shared, it means that the law and its institutions don't just disappear for a person or even a considerably large group of people who might not know they exist or how they work. In this way, and probably in at least a couple other ways, the law is not unlike a mountain. This, I think, is what Serial and even sometimes The Good Wife show us, that though the law might have some objective moral basis, it is still very much open to interpretation, but not, at least not in most cases, individual interpretation. The law becomes collectively what is invested into it by the people who practice it, comment on it, and are affected by it. And insofar as that investiture produces something which is communally acceptable, which aligns with widely held norms, the systems that enforce those norms, and the subjects of those systems, it might as well be an objective moral truth. Knowledge, they say, is consensus, and so too it would seem, to a certain degree, is the law. Whether that makes it right or just is another question entirely, and whether Sarah Koenig, in reporting on this particular case, worked with or against that consensus, or let it all speak for itself, is also another equally complicated question to answer. Is it possible for a journalist to be objective? And even if it is, do they have some kind of a duty to be so? The call for objectivity in journalism is long-standing, especially especially in the United States, but recently it seems like both its utility and its presence are being called into question. Does Serial play into that at all? Next time on Idea Channel. Can journalism be objective? Should it be? But for now, what do you think about the law and objectivity? Can the law be objective? Does Serial illustrate any of the principles that we talked about? Let us know in the comments. Oh my god, have you guys heard about the existence of CSI Cyber? I cannot wait for all of the extremely accurate portrayals of Leet Haxing. Let's see what you guys had to say about the interview and abstraction. First things first, and perhaps most importantly, Office Hours is a thing we have figured out. On February 7th, from noon to 3, I'm gonna be hanging out at the IBM Building Pavilion in Manhattan in New York. It is 590 Madison Avenue. So we'll put all of the details in the description. Um, there will probably be some other details that we'll figure out the day of, like where exactly in the pavilion. So probably the best way to keep up to date with that stuff is to follow Idea Channel on 
Twitter, but hey, office hours, come for 20 minutes, come for five minutes, come for the whole thing. I'm just gonna be there hanging out. I have a lot of Deadpool comics that I have to read, so if no one shows up, hey, I'm gonna be happy because I have Deadpool to read, but I hope that I get to see a bunch of you there. And if you can't make it, don't worry about it. We're gonna do more of these in the future. So it's, it's not, don't stress out. If you can't make it on February 7th, you will have another chance, I promise. And it won't take three years this time. Again, promise. Pro Marshmallow on the subreddit and a bunch of other people pointed out that my description of the history of money was not entirely accurate and that really where money started was with debt and barter economies. It moved into currency and then back to debt. And so to say that money started or went from currency to abstracted credit and records and stuff is not entirely accurate. That is very true. Thank you for pointing that out. Watching also on the subreddit points out that there was some missing nuance, which I totally agree with. Um, John McCain, the person who said that um, the North Korea hack was an act of war, is not himself an authority. He is just a, he is a person. He's a person who works for the government, but still not an authority. And also the idea that abstraction in this way or applying it to policy or to the actions of nations isn't necessarily a new thing. And I think that this is, this is my, my sort of biggest regret in putting this episode together, which is that um, I think I think more historical context would have been really helpful and would have made this a lot more informative. But yeah, thank you for this comment watching. Sandy Woodham wonders whether or not the portrayal of North Korea and Kim Jong-un in the interview really does more harm than good. And yeah, I've, I've said before that, you know, I think that, that we should be able to make jokes about anything, but that it takes a great amount of skill in order to create humor, but also remind people that the thing they're laughing about is terrible. And yeah, I question whether or not the interview accomplished that thing. Carl Smith says that he agrees abstraction played a role in all of this, but then also, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, Carl, kind of talks about how um, as abstraction plays a larger and larger role in important uh, parts of life, like foreign policy, um, there's a kind of, it kind of requires this almost metacognition that, you know, it's important to think about how we think about things so that um, when you are reading into or trying to interpret these abstracted concepts or entities, you're not just jumping right into a confirmation bias and reading in it what you want to or what you expect to. And there were a lot of comments that that were along along that line, the line of, well, the United States um, government, uh, the people who were reacting to these kinds of things, they just saw in it what they wanted to see in it. One of those comments comes from Cher S, who says that you can very easily read this situation as one where both sides are just looking for an excuse to aggressive eyebrow at one another. Um, but then goes on to talk about how you can also see the internet as a kind of cure for itself, which is an interesting concept that I've never heard articulated this way before, that it kind of levels the playing field in both a scary but also empowering way. And um, yeah, I mean, I, this I think that is optimistic, and I, I applaud that. Optimism. Adeptus Forge, yes. Samuel Doton, yes. Wild Performer, yes. This is a great comment. Links to this one and all of the others in the doobly-doo. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these uncoverers of natural morality. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. Links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from Flamshiz, who pointed me towards Caché Monet, which you just have to go to. Your day is not complete. You didn't know that yet, but now you do. Caché Monet, your life is going to get so much better. Wow.